Hello world! Um, so today this video is about um, my former job which was being a flight attendant and basically why I am no longer doing that and why I wasn't happy doing that. I wanted to make this video because I know there are a lot of people that are curious about what it's like being a flight attendant. It wasn't what I imagined. <laughs> Uh, so before I start, I have to say that I worked for a regional, um, which means that it was a smaller airline, and basically their business model is pretty much built on saving as much money as possible. So we worked for um, a bigger airline, Delta, um, but we were contracted to them, uh, which basically means that you don't get a lot of the benefits that like I get like a flight attendant. Um, would get. I'm gonna make sure this is recording. Okay, we're good. So my disclaimer is that the fact that I work for a regional instead of a uh, mainline also makes a big difference. The goal for most flight attendants is to work mainline because pretty much everything is better at that point. Um, is my understanding of it. Okay, number one. Um. I think this is one of the most shocking things that flight attendants first learn when they get the job and most people that are flying don't know is that flight attendants don't get paid until the boarding door closes. Now I don't know if this is true for every company but I think it is true for the majority. Um, so basically, you know, when you have passengers coming on and everyone's like putting their bags up and you're helping them out and all of that stuff, you're not getting paid for that. Um, and the same after the plane lands and everyone's getting off, you don't get paid for that. Um, so that might not sound bad, except the problem is, for example, since I worked for a regional, we had a lot of short flights. So sometimes you would have like three or four hour long flights in a day. Um, you need at least 30 minutes to board and then like I know they're like at least 15 minutes to deplane. So throughout the course of a day, that can end up being like three or four hours that you're working, but you're not getting paid for it. And if you're working in first class, you're also serving drinks. Um, so you're definitely doing work. There's a lot of work that you do as a flight attendant that unfortunately you don't get paid for. Um, the boarding door thing is just one example of that. With the company I worked for, Whenever there were delays, you don't get paid for that. So, you know, say something went wrong with the plane or whatever, and you're having to sit on the ground for an extra two hours and waiting for it to get fixed. Um, sometimes you're like serving out pretzels and cookies to passengers and stuff because um, they're getting very antsy. You're not getting paid for that. Another thing we also didn't get paid for is um, whenever we had something called sits which is basically time that you would have in between flights. So say the first flight you're working is at like noon um, and then you land 2 p.m. Um, and then your next flight for the day is until 4. You're not getting paid from 2 to 4. You can't just walk away and go wherever you want because you're you still having another shift coming up and navigating airport always takes a long time. They could work us up to 14 hours normally um, and if there was a delay they could work you up to 16 hours and unfortunately on some days that could mean you might get paid for like 10 of those hours, you might get paid for 8. So yeah, a lot of free labor. When you first start out you're typically on something called reserve. Depending on the company you work for it um, can last up to like one or two years or sometimes it's like an on and off thing but being on reserve basically means that you're on call. Um, for me it meant that I was on call 24-7 for all of the days that I was on call. So say that Monday through Friday I'm on call. Um, I don't really get a schedule besides knowing what days you know I might be called. So basically Monday through Friday I have to keep my phone on me on, at all times. If they call you, you have to respond within 10 minutes or you get a missed flight assignment. Um, so that means 
that you can get calls at 3 a.m., um, which happened to me, uh, especially quite a few times at the end, and it can get really frustrating because they only have to give you uh, two hours to get to the airport. So if you get called at 3 a.m., uh, hopefully you wake up and you're not a deep sleeper, um, but then you might only have like two hours to get uh, to the airport. And if you get called on Monday, I guess like the first day of a reserve block, then you might be gone till Friday. So hopefully you already started packing or you live super close to the airport. Unfortunately, since I live in LA, it's pretty much always a nightmare getting to the airport. Um, so two hours was always pushing it. Although, to be fair, there isn't much traffic at 3 a.m., so I guess that's the bright side of that. I worked as a flight attendant for about six months. Um, reserve for me, if I continued on, probably would have lasted like two years, which is pretty long. Um, and I didn't realize when I first got the job that it would be that long. They made it seem like it would be like six months or so. Uh, so that can make a huge difference, knowing how long you have to do that for. Not having control over your schedule is something that was a lot harder than I imagined because I thought, oh, I'm flexible, you know, I don't mind like getting calls being like, hey, you know, you're gonna like fly over to Texas or wherever it might be. Um, but yeah, that was a lot harder than I thought it would be. Number three, I would say you don't get to travel as much as you think. Now once again, um, since I work for a regional, I think I would say this is a little bit different based on whether you're working for mainline or not. We only flew on the west coast and then like Canada and Mexico. When I dreamed about being a flight attendant, I had this fantasy of like getting calls, being like, hey! You know, you're going to Costa Rica for three days or whatever. That wasn't the case. Um, since for us it was pretty much limited to, you know, very in the... It started to get very repetitious really quickly. I would end up going to San Francisco two or three times a week. It wasn't like I was jet setting to like new destinations all the time. And unfortunately, when you're on reserve, a lot of times you're getting the trips that people who aren't on reserve and who have more seniority than you don't want. So they're kind of the crappier trips, which can mean you're just going back and forth to a destination like LA, Houston, Houston, LA. A lot of times it means that you have shorter layovers as well. So if you get a 12 or a 13 hour layover, you know, you sleep, you go downstairs for breakfast, take a shower, maybe go to the gym. I also imagined myself traveling more when I was off work. Let's be honest. One of the main reasons people become flight attendants is for the flight benefits. While you're on reserve, if you have so little control over your schedule, it's very hard to travel. You're getting free flights, but it's standby. You have to try and predict, you know, if there'll be space on a flight, and that can change very quickly. Especially if you work for a regional. People are prioritized when you're trying to fly for a certain airline for free. It's based on, you know, what company you work for. If I was trying to get on a Delta flight, people that work directly for Delta have a higher status than I do. So they could come in at the last minute and knock me down when I thought that I would be able to get on a flight. So you kind of have to plan ahead and have quite a few days open before you travel anywhere so that you can get back home before you're on call again. Which means that you can't go very far unless you have like at least four or five days or you're willing to risk having to pay for a plane ticket to get back home if there's no space available for standby. Uh, so unfortunately, I did not travel as much as I thought I would. I was able to go to Maui, which was really fun. So that was really nice. Number four, you don't get paid a lot as a flight attendant. Definitely, it ranges a lot depending on what company um, you work for. How much I got paid, um, like how much I got paid. 
I, if I worked there for a whole year, I would have made about like $15,000 for the whole year. Per diem can sort of change things a lot and that's, that's pretty much the amount that you get paid when you're um, away from your base and that's like $1.40 per hour. But yeah, between like fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars is how much I would have gotten paid for a year. <laughs> if you live in any large city, um, especially Los Angeles, it's like impossible to live off of. Almost impossible. Most flight attendants I would say don't get paid a lot, but you certainly get paid more at the bigger companies. Um, I think for Delta, you can expect to make like 25000 your first year. So what I discovered when I actually started doing the job, um, I sort of naively assumed that they would give you an amount that you could afford to live off of because I was like, well, they have to. It's a full-time job, right? It was wrong. Um, and so when I first got there, I definitely started asking around, um, asking people like, how do you pay your bills with this? And I started to realize that a lot of flight attendants are like part-time flight attendants basically. They keep working as flight attendants in order to, to maintain their benefits, but that's not their main job. I met a lot of flight attendants that had their own businesses. Um, there were a lot of flight attendants that were married and their spouses made a lot more money than they did. There were a lot of a lot of flight attendants that still lived at home with their parents. You had to find some other way to support yourself um, because it wasn't sustainable otherwise. The company I worked for, there was this news article where a flight attendant actually got fired a couple years before I started working there because she went on the news and she said that she was on food stamps even though she has a full-time job. So I think they fired her because it looked bad for their image. But yes, the sad truth is that you can still work full-time as a flight attendant and still be on food stamps. I guess not because the airlines don't have more money to pay you. The way I thought of it was like, oh, you know, I won't get paid that much, but I'll have all these flight benefits. I realized that I wouldn't be able to use them as much as I did. And I realized unless you're someone that's going to take like an international trip every month, it's better to find a job with a normal salary and make time to travel with that because you'll be better able to afford it. Even when you do have time to go somewhere, it's like you can't do anything because you can't afford anything. Like I said, able to go to Maui, um, but I was there for like 48 hours and I was broke. Like I could barely afford to eat. No regrets, but yeah, something to think about. Number five. Am I on five? I think I might be on six. I don't know. Okay, this, so this rule is one that bothered me a lot, and I think it maybe bothered me more than some people, but I don't know, you tell me. Um, which is that airlines generally tend to have like very outdated rules about appearance, and I think it sort of disproportionately affects women. Um, there was like a whole handbook on our appearance everything from you know how many earrings you can have on each ear to how many rings you can wear what color nail polishes you're allowed to wear um so i'll i'll say the things that bothered me was first of all that you had to wear heels i thought that was unfair because obviously the men don't have to wear heels when you're working 12 to 14 hours heels can get very uncomfortable our airline had a rule that like once you got on the plane, um, then you could switch shoes to flats. But I still thought there was really no good reason for us to have to wear heels at all. The other thing was that hair was a big thing. When we got uniform standards, there were a bunch of pictures of, of how your hair could look and what was okay. And there was like one black woman. So it was like, okay, so is that the only hairstyle available to me? Um, so I remember in the beginning being very uncomfortable of trying to figure out like 
oh, if I wear my hair the way it naturally grows out of my head, is that going to cause an issue? Is that a uniform violation? Which is something I was not a big fan of. Which kind of brings me to my last point, the whole hair issue, which is racism. I worked with a lot of people that said quite a few questionable, offensive things and did lots of like offensive things. I've never encountered that in the workplace before and you know, I lived in the South for like a decade. Um, yeah, I will say there was one incident with a captain that started touching this other flight attendant's hair. Um, she had her natural hair, it was like, an, it was in an afro. And he kind of just like stuck both of his hands in there. Um, and he called over his co-captain to also do the same thing. And we were like in a hotel lobby. And he's like, hey, look over here, like come feel this. He's like sticking his face in it which is just generally like very inappropriate work conduct like you wouldn't if that woman had been a different race but it would have been very odd to be doing that to a co-worker like smelling her hair or putting your hands in it <laughs> so that was a very uncomfortable instance and um the woman that it happened to sort of just nervously laughed it off and afterwards i asked her and she's like you know, basically she's like, yeah, that was uncomfortable, but I didn't know what to do. That's just a glimpse. It's one thing to like face up from passengers because they're coming from all sorts of places. Like you don't know what to expect, but it's a completely separate thing when it's your coworker and saying, um, that can make you very uncomfortable. This video is going to be very long. I will leave off on a positive because I don't think anything is ever all bad. One of the best experiences I had as a flying attendant was um, one time where I had a trip that was uh, going to Houston and a bunch of other places. We got snowed in. Um, it snowed in Houston. So um, they canceled our flights. We were supposed to be, we were already in Houston, we were supposed to be coming back to LA. Because of the snow, they had to like cancel our flights and everything. Um, so we pretty much had a free day in the hotel um, and I hung out with the captain and co-captain who on this particular trip happened to be really cool, really nice guys. Um, and the whole day like we just, we played pool, um, we went swimming. It reminded me of like having snow days in school. That was really fun. And I just remember thinking like, oh, this is a really cool, unique experience that you wouldn't have if you worked an office job. Like, you get to meet so many people. A lot of them are really great people and it's a very unique experience. So yeah, that's a positive. Uh, yeah, ask me if you guys have any questions or anything um, or if you want me to elaborate on anything like that just write me a comment down below and yeah that's it i'll see you guys next time like and subscribe bye